Hi guys, Steve here from Four Sprung Suspension up in Whistler. Uh, welcome to another episode of Tuesday Tune, where we present technical information about suspension in the most poorly shot, terribly edited, and utterly humorous way. This week, we are going to look at the difference between springs and dampers. So I have with me here a Fox DHX2 coil shock. This is a downhill shock. Uh, the reason I've chosen this is because it shows a very simple separation of a spring and a damper in the physical sense. So everyone's familiar with what a coil spring is. Um, the job of the spring is to hold your weight up. It dictates your static sag, how much sag the bike has when you sit on it when it's not moving. Uh, and springs are essentially position dependent devices. So that means the further into the travel you are, the more force it's generating, the more, for the more force it's using to try to lift you up. Springs store energy. When you compress it, you do a certain amount of work, you compress it that far, that energy is then stored and returned to you. They only have one character, type of characteristic curve that really matters, and that is your force versus displacement. In the case of a coil spring, that is very linear, and it's written as a spring rate on the spring there. So you can see this one is a 500 pound an inch spring. Uh, this one has three and a quarter inches of available stroke, so free stroke. The net force the spring gives you is basically proportional in some manner to how far you are in the suspension's travel from where you should be. That should be position is your sag. So this part here is the damper, a uh, rear shock damper. Now you can see again, physical separation of the two components, spring, damper. The same applies in your fork. You'll have a physical separation of the damping unit and the spring unit in every case that I'm aware of. The, this will usually, in modern forks, be in separate legs. You'll have your spring in your left leg, your damper in the right leg, unless it's a you know, 2000 something or other Marzocchi, in which case they might have reversed it for no particular reason, even though it was that way the year before. So, the important part is this. Generates resistance according to how fast you compress it or extend it. Its job is simply to slow down motion. That's all a damper does. Um, it doesn't affect your static sag unless you have a damper that has a certain amount of platform built into it. You don't need the same amount of damping and compression as you do in rebound uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, rebound uh, speeds, uh, the only other force acting in rebound, I should say, is really the spring trying to extend your suspension. In compression, there's not really any limit to how fast you could move uh, the shaft in theory because you can always hit something faster. You know, you hit a big rock at 60 kilometers an hour, why not 70? So the damping curve, the characteristic curve that we care about here is the amount of force compared to the amount of speed in compression and in rebound. So the reason that we need to be able to understand the physical and technical separation of a spring and damper is so that we can understand uh, what job each one does uh, whether it's holding us up and returning us to position, which is the spring, or slowing down motion so that we don't have excessive movement, either in compression or in rebound. Um, in theory, if you had a completely undamped system, no damper, just a spring, then you'll get oscillation that never ends. So there's a few setup factors that we have to consider, um, well, all the setup factors we have to consider have to take into account what the spring does to affect it and what the damper does. So let's look at a few things, like small bump compliance. How does the spring affect it? If the bumps are really small and the amount of spring force isn't changing that much, it doesn't actually matter that much. A damper definitely has the ability to affect your small bump absorption. When I say small, I'm talking really quite small stuff, not braking bumps. Braking bumps are actually typically very big. Those smaller motions can't reach the same speeds as really big motions because they're reversing direction uh, much more often. So when I say small bump, I'm talking about stuff that is typically high frequency, like it's happening very quickly, um, but low amplitude. So it's not moving the suspension very far. And that means things like, you know, small rocks and whatnot. The low speed compression damping and low speed rebound have quite an effect on that. The spring has a small effect on the really small stuff and as the bumps get bigger, the spring force has more of an effect. Uh, the damper, it just changes where in the damper curve, like whether we're looking at the lower speed stuff or the higher speed stuff, that uh, the effect will be most noticeable. So let's look at big hit control. 
Landing jumps, uh, big, yeah, big fast hits essentially. So anything where you are landing off anything sizable is most certainly a high speed event. So the high speed aspect of your damping, the compression in particular, uh, becomes very relevant there. So that adjusting your high speed compression damping has a big effect uh, on those big hits. The spring also has a big effect because the displacement that you're seeing of the suspension is sufficiently large that changing the spring rate at all uh, affects the peak forces that you see and the amount of energy that the spring is able to absorb. So both of them have some effect there. Look at things like fork dive. Now fork dive is an interesting one because this is often ascribed to uh, insufficient low speed compression damping. It often isn't that that is the problem. So when you're braking, and when I talk about fork dive, I'm talking specifically about braking induced fork dive. When you're braking, that's happening at a very low speed, but there isn't a lot of overshoot of the position that it will reach uh, from a sort of consistent force being applied under brakes. And so that means the spring is actually the main thing that affects that. So if you have any issues with fork dive, uh, consider upping your spring rate slightly. Um, low speed compression, compression damping will slow that down to a certain degree, but where the compression damping really becomes useful there is when you actually start taking hits in that compressed state and you don't want it to use more travel than it has to and you want it to be able to rebound back to where it was so that your dynamic ride height stays sufficiently high. That is where compression damping really becomes useful and funnily enough, high speed compression damping actually has a huge effect on that. So in the case of fork dive, both your spring rate and your compression damping will have an overlapping effect. Uh, increasing either one will help the situation, uh, maybe not in the ways that people would initially expect. Let's look at also climbing geometry. So on the rear end of your bike in particular, this becomes really important. If you run too much sag, the bike sits back too much, there's not enough weight on the front wheel, uh, your saddle, and your seat angle tips back further, you're further over the rear wheel, the bike wants to wheelie more. Um, you can get more traction from running a uh, softer setup, but it's essentially spring rate that will have the biggest effect on this most of the time. Low speed compression damping will affect it as long as it's happening at very, very low speeds. And that means it's essentially some kind of platform system, a climb uh, assist, you know, lockout lever, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. And so in that case, it's your low speed damping and your spring that will have an effect. The spring, obviously, you run less sag. Um, the low speed damping will affect how far you're able to move back from that under small compressions or you know, even larger compressions while climbing. And that will basically, um, that will control how far from your sag point you're able to move. Both of them, again, have a substantially overlapping effect. Adjusting either one can help. Now we're gonna get into the part where springs and dampers really vary. And where they really vary is in the way that they deal with energy. And the reason that's particularly useful to consider it in this manner is because springs and dampers do the opposite of each other here. Spring stores energy and returns it. A damper just gets rid of it, turns it into heat. So that motion that you're getting, putting into your damper, is just dissipated to the atmosphere as heat. So, why is this such a useful way of thinking about it? Let's say, okay, I want my bike to be uh, firmer, but it's already kind of bouncing me around and it feels like it's not sticking to the ground. That's probably an example of a situation where you need the bike to dissipate more energy and to be more controlled. And so in that case, firming it up using the compression damping whether that be high speed or low speed is, again, situation dependent. But firming it up using compression damping will be more advantageous at that time than using the spring. Likewise with your rebound damping, um, that also affects how lively each end of the bike is. So when we talk about stability of the bike, um, there's obviously rebound control is a big part of that. We don't want a bike that extends at a completely uncontrolled rate that's dangerous among other things. And there is a phenomenon known as overshoot. And so that overshoot is basically when your suspension moves past the point that it's trying to get to, uh, whether that be you know, a compressed state under brakes or you know, under a 
any kind of heavy compression or back to the sag point. So let's consider reducing overshoot that. You, let's say you fly off a three foot or so high drop. You hit the ground. With no compression damping, the momentum of your body continues until the spring has absorbed all that energy and then it returns it to you. That takes a certain amount of time for it to compress, for it to build up the force necessary, um, and for it to stop you and then change the direction that the suspension is moving. By increasing the compression damping in that situation, you dissipate more energy over that, over that distance, or a shorter distance really, um, and it's happening faster. So your suspension reaches the point that it turns around or stabilizes and re-extends uh, faster and there's less energy to give back. So in that case, you get something that actually responds quicker in a sense in that the bike is more stable more quickly. However, if we, we don't always want more stability. Sometimes we want the bike to be more responsive. And so in those cases, then we might want less compression damping, less rebound damping. As a general rule, uh, how lively or dead your bike feels is entirely to do with how much energy is being stored in return and how much is being dissipated. So it's really useful to understand the role of the spring and the role of the damper in terms of how they deal with energy. All right, guys, that's about all we have time for this week. Uh, I hope there was something interesting or worth discussing or you, know, you learned something maybe uh, in all that. Uh, as always, please leave your feedback, comments, uh, what you like, what you didn't like underneath the video. Use your internet trolling skills and uh, yeah, see you next week.